one, two, three, four, five. Once I caught a fish alive. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then I let it go again. Why did you let it go? Because it bit my finger so. Which finger did it bite? This little finger on my right. Those are the famous words from an English nursery rhyme, depicting numerical order and anatomical orientation. But to me, that's my first learning experience as a child. Psychologists have told us in the first four years of life, we have very little memories. But that's my earliest memory that I can remember. Learning experiences are very important in cultivating your future lives. My mother, this is our house in Bangladesh where I was born and nurtured. My mother used to teach young children. She taught them basic English, the fundamentals of learning a new language. By sharing her knowledge, she empowered these children. She empowered them and filled their minds with aspiration. So, my thoughts to you is what was your first memory? Can you remember? Knowledge itself are facts, information, skills acquired by a mixture of experience and education. They are concrete, usually. Remember them. But also, they're quite practical. They help us in the world that we live in today. Learning itself requires prior knowledge. The knowledge base becomes a scaffold for future construction of learning. I would suspect that everyone in this room would agree with the following statements. Education is a fundamental human right for everybody in the world. I'm sure we would agree with that. I'm sure everyone in the audience also agrees the fallacy of that statement. Because education isn't free. It's not for all. It depends on two things. It depends on location and resource. So my question to you all is how do we change the paradigm of learning education so that we all share knowledge to as many people as possible? We have to think outside the box. We have to think about teaching many people and, and sharing a legacy long after we've passed the earth. As a surgeon, as a trainer, as a teacher, I spend my life thinking about how do I get the best out of my students. This picture comes to mind. This is a picture showing teaching in the operating theatre. It's called a theatre for a reason. You're on show. We haven't changed this sort of learning, not for decades, probably for centuries. We've accepted the dogma and tradition of healthcare for a long time without challenging it. My question to you, of course, is if we don't challenge the dogma and tradition of healthcare and training, we accept, by definition, mediocrity. Therefore, if you look at this picture, it shows people, the surgeon's center of attention, and as a surgeon, that's what I want to be like. I want to be the main person that everyone was surrounding. Sadly, it never happened. However, if you look at the learning example, it's not great. The person at the back of the room is trying to peer over many shoulders and being taught by someone center of stage. He's learning by osmosis and diffusion. This is not active learning, it's passive learning. It's terrible. But we've accepted this for many years, never challenged the idea. Medical students around the world will recognize this picture and understand. Medical students who come to my theater, for example, often you see them, we have five, six at a time, will sit at the back of the room. We have operations that go on for all day, eight, nine, 10 hours a day in that room, at the back. Do you know what they're doing? on their smartphones, on social media, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Snapchat, on Twitter. The learning itself needs to change. They're more part of that whole equation. We have a global problem. About two years ago, the Lancet Commission produced its report on global surgery. The first time it's been quantified in the world. It's estimated that five billion people, that's two thirds of the population, do not have access to safe and affordable surgery. To overcome the sum of this and make healthcare more equitable, we need to train two million surgeons today, just so they get the right sort of treatment that we take for granted here, sitting here in this audience. We need to create the resource to perform 150 million operations per year to make that equitable. So my question to you is, how do we overcome this? The world is becoming connected 
they're helping us. The big global companies are now creating balloons into the cloud. They're putting drones into the air. And they're putting cables under the sea to help us create high-speed Wi-Fi access. The unquenchable thirst for the internet and connections is now hopefully being solved over the next five or ten years. Imagine you're a surgeon in Tanzania, like the man in this picture. You have aspirations to be the best surgeon that you can be. You want to improve the standards of your local rural population. You can't leave because of resource and geography. You have every right to offer your patients the very best treatment. Using all those knowledges, then, two years ago, I decided to live stream an operation using Google Glass. Simple, wearable technology. It's, it's, a, it's like a smartphone on your head. With one click, you can stream live across the globe. Also, what we did on that day was allow the Google Glass to be projected around the globe, and students around the globe could actually watch the operation through my eyes, points of view, and put in text messages, which would then come onto my glass. I could talk to them at the same time and answer them. On that day, I trained 14,000 people across the globe in 118 countries, just showing you a power of simple connectivity, simple wearable device can change the lives of many people and educate many. It's not about one-to-one, -one, not one-to-two. Think about one-to-many. Think about sharing that knowledge with as many people as possible with impact in life. Virtual reality has been discussed already. A year ago, I, was, I performed the world's first operation using virtual reality technology. We talked about telemedicine. What I talked about earlier is about telemedicine. It's about remote teaching. The person in Tanzania is still there and connecting via the net. What about if we bring them to you, into your operating theater, to be close to you, so they can learn from you in a different way, virtually? So last year, we used a, a camera rig, 360 camera rig. We recorded a live operation, which we sent out to the world. People around the world could access the feed using, essentially, a smartphone, which is ubiquitous around the world, a free app, and a Google Cardboard headset. A Google Cardboard headset costs $5. Suddenly, high fidelity, low cost, seems a way we can penetrate those markets. That operation is watched by 55,000 people in 140 countries and 4,000 cities. I can't name 4,000 cities if I've tried. But clearly, the interest around the world was unique. It's about connecting the human mind. I have a confession to make. I have an addiction, or some would call it affliction, to social media. I think we all share some of those <laughs> afflictions. Social media is interesting. I look at social media in a completely different light, because I think it's about empowering people, because it connects huge amounts of people around the globe. Let's think about it. Facebook. We use it all the time. It's got two billion active users. Two billion. A third of the population. Instagram has 300 million users on a daily basis. Twitter, again, 300 million users. And Snapchat, 150 million users. So what about social media in a different way? How can we empower people with social media? Earlier this year, in January, I was in Bangladesh doing some operations on some patients for the work that I do philanthropically. And I thought, let's connect people to Facebook Live. One click on Facebook Live, suddenly I was training 10,000 surgeons, all communicating on one click on Facebook Live. First time we've done a live operation in that way. Why not? Because it's there, it's free already, and people to learn in that manner. What about Twitter? About two or three months ago, I was given the honor to curate the app NHS account. Yes, I ran the account for the whole NHS. I tweeted about my life as a surgeon, about my family, about what I do for a living, but also I thought I might tweet an operation, given the opportunity. Why not? It's in dangerous hands, right? So I actually tweeted the world's live, first live operation using tweets of 140 characters or less, using videos and images. It went viral. That operation was followed by one million people in the UK. And we're trying to demystify the process of operations of surgery and medicine as a whole. People understand that. We need to be open and transparent about what we do. Why not use social media in that regard? What about Snapchat? Interesting. Snapchat, it's the most powerful 
augmented reality platform at the moment. We don't realize it's really powerful. It has those filters, right? And actually, if you think about the usage of Snapchat, 75% of those 150 million users between the ages of 17 and 25, the same age as my medical students, same age as my trainees. They understand different way of learning. So in November, I performed the world's first Snapchat operation across the globe. What we did, I used the spectacles that had just come out. And I, you can click on the button, it records 10 second clips. So I thought, can I train people in 10 second bites? Condense it, make it relevant, and think about strategy of teaching. So we did that, and it went viral. Within 24 hours, it had 100,000 downloads on YouTube. It was watched by 2 million people. Within a month, it had been retweeted, tweeted, or favorited by 54 million people. So it showed you the power of connecting people using platforms is far-reaching, and perhaps a way we can do better. Let's take it further. This is, of course, the ultimate selfie. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. You see, we've talked about remote teaching using Google Glass. We've talked about virtual reality, bringing people towards you. What about if you could transport yourself to another part of the globe? using teleportation, holoportation. So we captured my avatar. They called me the virtual surgeon, but I really did become the virtual surgeon two months ago with this image. Because we can create photoreal images with body, volumetric depth. We can then place that and hopefully transport it to another part of the globe. These are 104 cameras. Each camera has a resolution of 36 megapixels. So you can recreate a human being. What about if you add artificial intelligence into the face. So it speak to people. Suddenly, you can transport yourself into another world and actually be remote and be there teaching and training people despite being in London. That's going to be the next solution for us. To help a billion people in this world, we need to connect a billion minds. Thank you very much.